the argument that rock is dead has much to do with the fact that in the past decade or so, there really haven't been any new rock bands that have blown up massively on a global scale, the way bands like Zeppelin, Guns N' Roses, or Nirvana did. This isn't to suggest that there haven't been very successful rock bands, but truth be told, there hasn't been any one band that has reached the level of major mainstream success those gigantic bands of the past did. I personally believe it can happen again, but why hasn't it happened yet? I asked this question to veteran radio broadcaster Alan Cross, and I also asked him if Nirvana had come out today, would they have become as big as they did in the 90s? This is what he had to say. That's a really good question. Um, I think that they would be popular. I think that they would get a lot of critical love. I think that they would probably be able to sell out venues much like Greta Van Fleet did. But to change the world, no. no we, we just don't have world-changing artists anymore. And the reason is we, be, we can't all agree on which artist should change the world. Back in the 90s when Nirvana came out, there was no internet. There was no... Uh, you had to sit in front of the TV to watch much music or MTV, hoping that your favorite video would come on instead of going on to see you too, uh, or going on to YouTube. Um, you had, um, and if you wanted the music, you had to go and purchase a piece of plastic for, you know, 15 or $20 or whatever it was. And that's a lot of money. And you would cherish that disc and you would listen to it over and over and over again to get your money's worth out of that disc. And back then, too, you had four things that were basically running the music industry. You had radio, you had the record labels, you had record stores, and you had the video channels. And every once in a while, all four of them would come together in a consensus, saying that this band is good. Everybody needs to like this band. And we went, oh, okay. And that's the way it had been for, well, since the beginning of the recorded music industry. But by the time we get to the 2000s, we don't need record stores anymore because we've got Napster and Audio Galaxy and LimeWire and BearShare and Kazaa and all the other uh, file sharing programs, which allowed us to acquire all the music that we could never afford. And we didn't have to buy the whole album either. We could only buy the songs we wanted. And once you got online, you would find people who were just like you, and you would plumb through their collection of online files and go, okay, well, if this person likes this, then they must like, I, I should check out some of the other music that they like, and I might like it. So it's a completely different, the rules are completely changed. Nothing is the same as it used to be. and we will never see that kind of mass consensus about what's good. I mean, even, you know, the, the biggest mainstream stars like your Beyonce's and your uh, Lady Gaga's and your Justin Bieber's and your One Direction's and even your BTS's, uh, they, when it comes to the amount of cultural penetration that they have versus what kind of cultural penetration music used to have back in the day before the internet, apples and oranges. We all want what we as individuals want. We don't necessarily all group together and want the same thing at the same time in the numbers that we used to back in the day. So um, the economics of the music industry have changed and the attitudes of music consumers have changed. So you put those two things together and you, know, you could actually make a real argument for saying that Kurt Cobain was the last pure rock star we'll ever have. The internet's only going to become more and more prevalent in our lives, so the idea of a centralized band is going to become even less and less um, practical. So do you think that like the bands pre-internet are going to have more of a longevity than, let's say, bands that come out now because they had that centralized focus? Well, the heritage bands have a huge catalog of great music. That's the reason they're heritage bands, is because they were really good at writing and recording songs. And those songs are going to exist forever. So if you, you know, let me just back up a little bit. Back in the day, things were very tribal. So on one hand, you had the classic rock, or sorry, the, the, the rockers. And on the other hand, you had the alternative kids. They were at war, these tribes. You, as an alternative kid, were not allowed to like anything 
that the rockers liked. So no Led Zeppelin, no Beatles, no Rolling Stones, no Leonard Skinner. That was all dinosaur rock crap. We were smarter. We were more enlightened. We were into, you know, much more music that was much more interesting than that crap. And it worked the opposite way. So if you wanted to move from the alternative tribe to the rocker tribe, you'd be beaten up going in. And then when you crawled home with your tail between your legs to your alternative friends, they'd beat you up for being a traitor and vice versa. Today, one of the things about the Internet is that the silos, these tribes have broken down. And you talk to anybody who's 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 years old, and you look at their playlist on their phone. I mean, you know, they're listening to ACDC and they're listening to Ariana Grande. They're listening to Led Zeppelin and they're listening to Drake. And they're listening to Billy Holiday in some cases. And they're listening to Jeff Buckley. I mean, they're extraordinarily ecumenical in their tastes. What we're seeing is, is today's music fans have no trouble mining different genres and mining different eras. And they're going back to the first, you know, 50 years of rock and they're finding out that, you know what, there's some really good stuff here. I mean, an ACDC song from 1978 still sounds pretty damn good today. You know, you listen to, you know, Good Times, Bad Times from, from Led Zeppelin. You can't believe that what was, that was recorded in 1969. And of course, everybody's discovering the Beatles and who doesn't, you know, you cannot not like the Beatles. It just doesn't, I mean, they're eternal. So uh, that's part of the problem, too, is, is that now that the almost the entire expanse of human musical creations is available with a few pokes at your phone, that's what today's artists have to deal with. That's, what, that's their competition. Mm-hmm. It's not like if I was a kid in 19 – I'm 20 years old. I'm in 1991. Uh, the music that I hear, the music that I'm into is what I hear on my radio station and what I can afford to buy. Maybe I have an older brother and sister who have some stuff, but you know, basically I want my music for my generation. Certainly don't want my parents' music. Now I can listen, if I'm 20 years old, I can listen to anything. And you know what? My parents, who grew up as Generation X, they had some pretty cool records, so I'm going to listen to them. That leaves a smaller and smaller slice for up and coming artists because they're competing with the greatest music of all time. Well, we go back to this idea of uh, the song economy. Nobody wants to invest long term in acts. We just want to get as much money as we can out of individual songs. That's it. And the other thing, too, is that uh, with the audience not wanting, you know, the, the consensus is that, you know, I'm. There's so much music out there. I'm only going to give my love and attention to so many bands. That's back in the day. You have to understand that the record labels created this artificial shortage. They were the cultural filter. They only let through what they thought was good. That would then go to the record stores, which would only stock the stuff that they thought was would good was good. And then the video channels would only play what they thought was good. And then radio stations would only play what they thought was good. So there were all these different filters that uh, created you know, a real finite amount of music that people could choose from. Now, you can choose from 60 million songs on Spotify. All that is gone. There is a, a site called Forgotify that you can connect to your um, Spotify account, and it will spit out a series of songs that have never, ever been played even once by anyone on Spotify. So if that's – there's it's, an estimate, it's estimated that 20% – of the 60 million songs on Spotify have never been played once. Wow. And, you know, Spotify is adding, so what is it, 12 million songs a year? It's like, who's got time for all this? And the problem is it was created this, this situation where, uh, okay, I'm listening to this. Okay, I really like it. Okay, but there's got to be something else out there. So you, you don't spend time with these songs anymore. And this leads into a whole other discussion. The problem is that, you know, when you bought an album with 12 songs on it, you listened to those 12 songs over and over and over again. That became your world. Now you've got 60 million songs to choose from. And you might be liking the song that you're listening to now, but there's that nagging feeling that is this what everybody else is listening to? Is there something better than this? Is there something else that, uh, you know what, I'm bored with that already. Let's just move on to something else.